<laughs> well, whoo, glory to God. I was really overwhelmed with uh, his spirit during worship today. So we're going to endeavor to get out exactly what he wants out today and not let anything distract us from that. You know, he put on my heart the message about the genealogy of Jesus, and I named it Ancestry.com, the branch. And last week we looked at some of the genealogy, the lineage of Jesus. We looked at it through Matthew's eyes, we looked at it through Luke's eyes. Um, and, but you know, 2020 was a year of seeing as God sees. Yeah. Seeing as God sees. So today, I believe we're going to get the viewpoint of how God sees all of this. Last week, it was more about how man sees it. We looked at, the, like I said, we looked at the natural genealogy, we looked at the uh, spiritual genealogy, how, how God is involved in all of this because Jesus was God's seed. But Jesus was also David's seed. And that's a reference to the physical as well as the spiritual. So um, I, I want to read a verse here. I, I, have to, I have to read this verse that he's speaking to me about. Hmm. David was a king. Before I read the verse, David was a king. His line was to be an eternal king. And Jesus is called the branch of David, the branch, the righteous branch. And the Lord had declared it in so many ways that Jesus would be the branch. Before Jesus was even named, the Lord was saying, the branch will come. The branch will come. So I'm going to read out of Isaiah 11, and I'm going to read quite a bit of it. If you'll just listen to it, Isaiah 11, starting with verse 1. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And his roots, a branch will bear fruit. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. We're talking about this year has been a year of seeing as God sees. All of our messages go back to that word that Pastor got from the Lord, seeing as God sees. And here the declaration that the branch is coming, a shoot of Jesse, who we know was David's father, so a shoot of Jesse, which is David, and a branch will come from that. We know that to be Jesus. Jesus is the branch. It said the spirit of the Lord would rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he would delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not decide by what he hears with his ears. In other words, he would see as God sees. Because he wasn't going to judge by what he saw with his natural eyes, and he wasn't going to judge by what he heard with his ears. And you can imagine Jesus growing up as he did. We all know his, his history. We know he was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, heard all kinds of things about who he wasn't, right? According to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and what he couldn't do. Even the devil took, when Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness, the devil comes and says, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't judge by what he saw with his eyes. Right? 
He didn't judge by what he saw. He's out in the desert. He's got nothing. He didn't judge by what he saw. And he didn't judge by what he heard with his ears. No, he judged by what he heard in his heart. That's seeing as God sees, because that's where God speaks to us. He speaks to us in our hearts. So we as a people, created in the image and likeness of God, following Jesus, are not to judge by what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears. We are not to judge by what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears. And how much easier it would be if we weren't looking and we weren't listening. Come on. That's good. But if we're constantly looking at the wrong thing, it's going to be really hard not to judge by what we're seeing. If we're constantly listening to the wrong thing, it'll be hard not to judge what we're hearing. However, if we are listening and looking at the right thing, Him, Him, our eyes always focused on Him, always being heavenly minded, always looking unto Him, the author and finisher of our faith, to see what He says about the situation, to let Him show us what He says about the situation. And I believe that's what this message is about. In the natural, you look at the genealogy, and I preached it last week. We looked at Matthew, and we looked at Luke, and we, we named all the people that were in the line of Jesus. And I know even as I'm saying it, and I'm, I'm, I'm addressing that Rahab was in his line, and, and uh, Tamar was in his line, I could, I could feel in the room there's a, almost a justification of, Oh, thank God, there's somebody messed up in that line, too. It almost gives us, you know, it almost gives us relief knowing we got jacked up people in our line. If Jesus had jacked up people in his line, it's okay if we do, too. And yes, but that's the man's side. That's the man's side. That gave comfort to our soul. And he cares about our soul. The word says that Jesus is the author and, or the bishop of our soul. He's the bishop of our soul. That means he's the guardian of our soul. So he cares about what's going on in our soul. Yes, he does. But that is the man's side. Yeah. But we're a three-part being, right? We are spirits. We have souls and we live in a body. And he ministers to the whole man. So this message isn't just about the natural line the people that were in his line for the sake of us feeling better about ours. That's not what it's about. It's about why those people were in that line. You see, Jesus had to come in the flesh. In order to take our place, he had to come in the flesh. But Jesus was always with God. He always was and he always will be. When God said, let us make man in our image, he was talking to Jesus. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit was hovering. So they were always together. Yes. Jesus always was. And then we know that uh, the Lord spoke to Abraham. And Abraham, Abraham walked with the Lord. Yeah. And two angels that came to give him a promise. So Jesus was always and still is. But when he walked on the earth and spoke to Abraham, he came as the Lord. But then when he came through Mary, he came as a man. It said he laid down his deity. He laid down his glory, that which he had with the Father from the beginning. And then we see that he was baptized in the river Jordan and the Holy Spirit came upon him and anointed him. So now he's a man anointed by the Holy Ghost walking on the earth. The branch, the seed of David. The seed of David, the promised one. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts, chapter 13. Pastor, before I got up here, he was talking about us sharing what we know with everyone we come in contact with. 
And it's not necessarily about sharing all the bad history we have. It's about sharing the change that he's made in our life. Sometimes you have to reveal some of your history to get that point of contact with him, but you don't stay there because it's not about you. It's about him. And so I don't personally believe we have to reveal all the dirty, dumpy trash that was in our life because it's not about us. Yeah. It's about him. Come on. Now I've done that in the past. I can't hold that. I'm gonna leave that with you. I've done that in the past myself. In certain situations, it has seemed necessary because people take issue with not being able to relate to Jesus for some reason. Like he doesn't get it. <laughs> but Jesus gets it. <laughs> he gets it. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 13 because it is exactly what Pastor talked about. It is these men relating to the men they're talking to what Jesus did and how it relates to them. So go to Acts. You're already there. I'm the only one that's not there. Okay. All right, well, we're going to get there. Um, let's see. Isn't it fun, I think about this, um, when the angels came to Mary, or to the shepherds, pastor preaches on Christmas Eve, he came to the sh shepherds and he said, we have glad tidings, meaning good news, which should be great joy to all the people. Good news. And you're going to see here that Paul says the same thing. We declare unto you good news. Good news. We have some good news for people. Amen. We do. Yes. You might not feel like you do, but you do. Yes. It's not about how you feel. All right. So here, let's see. I'm trying to give you a... We're going to pick up with verse 14 of Acts 13. This is about Paul and Bar Barnabas. They've been traveling. And in verse 14, it says, Paul and Barnas Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue, synagogue for services. After the usual readings from the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. So Paul stood up, lifted his hand to quiet them, and started speaking. Men of Israel, he said, you and God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. So right now we know he has two audiences. He has the men of Israel and God-fearing Gentiles. Gentiles meant non-Jewish, those not from the tribe of Israel. It can also mean heathen, unbelieving. Because in the day of Israel, before, when Jesus was on the earth, only, gen, only Israel believed. All of the name, we, Israel wasn't to mix with any of the nations by law. But God had a heart for the Gentiles, as well as Israel. So Paul is addressing all of them, men of Israel and you God-fearing Gentiles. Listen to me. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with a powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery. He put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Okay, verse, I'm skipping a little bit for the sake of time. Verse 20, all this took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. So first, God's leading them through, through the wilderness. Then it says he gave them judges to rule until Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king. So they have God leading them. Then the judges come. And now the people are begging for a king. We want a king. The people of Israel saying we want a king. They're begging Samuel because Samuel hears from God. 
So they're begging for a king. So it says, God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. We're talking about the branch, Jesus being a branch. And, verse 23, it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. Now keep in mind, who is he talking to? He's talking to Israel and Gentiles. So this is applicable to anyone you come in contact with. Israel and Gentiles. Whoever you come in contact with, this applies. Because that's who he's talking to. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And it was one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. All right, skipping on down. Verse 32, he says, Now we are here to bring you this good news, just like the angels did to the shepherds. We are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors, and God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm says about Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. For God has promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said... I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Turn over to Romans 15. We're laying the foundation. Romans 15. Romans 15, starting with verse 8. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. There's the same word, ancestors. Acts 13, he was talking about their ancestors. Who's he talking to? Israel. Their ancestors. Who would that be? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the men they call father. Their heritage. So here he says, remember, Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promise he made to their ancestors. He also, verse 9, came so that the Gentiles, that's us, those of, of, of non-Israel heritage, anyone that does not have Israel as a heritage, that's who it's for, Gentiles. So there's, there's Israel on the earth and there's Gentiles on the earth. And now today, because of what Jesus did, there's the church. So there's three groups of people on the earth today. Israel, Gentiles, and the church. We happen to be the church because we've already been brought in. But Paul is talking here. He also, Jesus also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. So we, I believe, we as the church of God need to learn what Jesus means to those that don't know. And we need to be able to communicate it in a way that they get it. And here it is in a nutshell. There was a king that reigned on the earth. David was his name. David was promised by God himself in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that David's seed would reign as king forever. That's it in a nutshell. We were to have no other kings. Jesus is king.
and unpack it a little more. I can never wait to kind of hear wheels. Wheels turning. We need to connect the dots. Jesus is the branch. But in Revelations, Jesus said he's not only the branch, he's the seed. Let's go there. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Uh, oh, I love this. Verse 16. Revelation 22, verse 16. Now this is Jesus appearing to John, giving him the revelation of himself. And this is what he said. I, Jesus, in King James, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. See, John was to write letters to the churches. So Jesus is giving him instruction. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, New Living says it this way. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both, both the source of David and the heir to his throne. Jesus always was. God always was. Wow. Even when you didn't know him, he always was. Even before you bo were born, he was. This Jesus wasn't an oops, I gotta fix things plan. This Jesus is God wanting to come and live the life of a man. so that his man could enjoy the life he had planned for him yes. all along. He's the source of David, the root of David. Now, there are people in David's line, we talk, or in Jesus' line, we talked about that. And we, and we need to realize this. We have Tamar, who is a woman that tricked her father-in-law to have sex with her so that she could conceive because her husband, his son, was dead. And he had no other sons. But she had a burden in her heart to continue the line. He was Judah. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus was to come through Judah. Judah's sons were dead. And Tamar has a burden in her heart, so much so that she'll go, she'll stoop to the level of disguising herself to have sex with her father-in-law. Man, that twists our head, right? Why would someone do that? The burden to continue the line to continue the seed, the burden to have that child. And then you have, we also have Rahab, who, she is a, a harlot in Jericho. A Gentile. Not one of Hebrew descent. And the spies come to her and she recognizes, I know the God you serve. She's watched. She's seen what God has done. Remember what her profession is. She's in Jericho, the one city on the path for the boys to go from here to there. Kind of like Oceanside. Don't you think she's getting an earful every now and again of, wow, you wouldn't believe what God did to the king. Oh, you wouldn't, be you wouldn't believe what God did to this God, these, these 
this Israel army, we don't know what's happening, but every time we go out, we, they, we get defeated and they win. We don't know how it's, she's hearing all this. So when the spies come, she's like, I'm siding with them. I'm siding with the God you serve. So she's spared. She's a Gentile also. Tamar's a Gentile. Rahab's a Gentile. We're talking about Jesus being here for Gentiles and Jews. And then you have Bathsheba. Interestingly enough, Bathsheba's not a Gentile. She's actually a priest by birth. She's of the priestly line. And through Bathsheba and David's uniting, now the line of priest and king are one. Because she's from the priest line, David's from the king line. Jesus is a king and a priest. So Bathsheba brings the priest part in. David is a king. We have priest and king. And they have four sons. Two of which are the line that Jesus came through. Solomon and Nathan. Joseph comes through Solomon. Mary comes through Nathan. This is all important because it had to be legal. Everything God did had to be legal. He had to get into the earth legally. What am I talking about? Well, Satan got into the earth illegally. He came to rule and to reign, to usurp the authority that Adam had. And he did it through the woman. He deceived her, who then was able to get Adam part of it, and now they've given their rightful ruling over to Satan. And God's going to get it back for his man, and he's going to do it legally. And how does he do it? He uses people. All through the line, you can see he used people, and not just Jews. He used Gentiles, too. You see, redemption can only come by Jesus Christ. Redemption, the buying back, the being, being brought back to your original stat status, if I can say it that way, your original position, your original position as a creation of God, redemption can only be done by the blood of Christ. So Bathsheba and Tamar, and Rahab all believed in the blood of Christ to come. We believed in the blood of Christ that has come, but they were on the other side, the future believing, and they were saved. The Bible tells us Rahab and all her house were saved. Redemption, the buying back and being brought back to our original intended condition, a place of honor, a place of dignity. All these people that we look at and think, oh good, Jesus had them in their line. Wait a minute, he redeemed them, just like he redeemed me. Yes. Just like he redeemed you. Turned it around, restored all things. Because he was the branch. How did he do it? Well, let's go to Romans. Romans, what chapter? 15, I think. I might look. second. I don't think it's 15. Okay. We're going to look at Romans chapter 11.
Paul, this is Paul who wrote the book of Romans. And he says in verse 13, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. So he's saying, I'm going to talk to you, and in doing so, I hope to provoke Israel, because he was, a, he was of Israel. So he's saying, what I'm going to tell you should make them want it. If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the fr first fruit be holy, the lump is holy. Who's the first fruit? Jesus. Jesus is the first fruit. Jesus is the branch. If the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy. If the first fruit is holy, everything that comes from that is holy. If some of the branches be broken off and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if you boast, you bear not the root, but the root bears you. So what's he talking about? Remember I talked about the dead stump in my yard last week? And it looked like there's no life there. And all of a sudden, life springs from that. Let's say I want to replicate that bush. It's hardy. It came out of nothing, it looks like. And I want to replicate that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take a branch from it. And I'm going to take another plant, a wild plant, just as this said, and I'm going to cut it and I'm going to attach the branch to it. And the life that's in that branch is going to go into that plant and change that plant. Now Jesus is the branch. Here it's saying we're branches. Because Jesus is not only the branch, we know he was the root. He's the root, he's the branch, and he's the offspring of David. So he's before David, he's during David, and he's after David. Right? So how is it that we Gentiles who do not have Israeli blood in us, some of us may here in this room, some of us might be of, of Abraham's physical descendants, but those that are not Abraham's physical descendants are spiritual descendants. So how do we get in on the goodness of being a descendant. We get in on it because we were grafted in. Jesus was pierced in the side, cut, so that new branches can be put in. See, this is a very real happening in the eyes of God. We're talking about seeing it from God's perspective, not man's perspective. There's a whole lot more going on here than meets the eye. It's not about us just getting saved and going to heaven. It's not about that. It's not about you having a, I almost said the word, crappy life, and then meeting Jesus along the way and accepting him to make your life better. And then finding out as you travel along the way, it's a little harder than you thought. And thought well, man, I thought I got saved. Why is it so hard? Because you don't know who you are and what's going on. But it's about getting the perspective of God. He had a plan for Jesus, the seed of David, to rule and reign on the earth like Adam was to rule and reign on the earth. And he hasn't abandoned the plan. He just so happened to make you a part of the plan. First Samuel 16, God tells Samuel, I have chosen one of Jesse's sons to be king. And then in Samuel, he tells David, your son will be king forever. 
Your son will be king forever. So what, did, what does he say to us? I'm going to find it in a minute. Go to Hosea, Hosea chapter 3. This is a word spoken to the prophet Hosea. Hosea chapter 3, starting with verse 4. The children of Israel will abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. These are all the things they trusted in. And he's saying they're not going to have them for many days. Verse 5, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. That's talking about now. In the latter days. Zechariah chapter 14. And his feet... Whose feet? The son of David. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave, split in the middle, toward the east and toward the west, and there will be a very great valley. There's not a valley there now, is there? You were just there on the Mount of Olives, and there wasn't a valley. It was around it, but it wasn't through the middle. This is saying the valley will now be in the middle because the mountain will split east to west when he touches it. And there will be a very great valley. Half of the mountain will remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. There will be one Lord and his name will be one. Jesus is coming as king. Jesus is coming to reign as king on the earth. We have a part to play in that. Our part to play is getting the people ready for his return. To do what Acts chapter 13 says about telling them how Jesus relates to their lives. Go to first first Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter six. Starting with verse 1. When one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? The world? I think we just need to let that sink in for a minute. We believers will judge the world. We who believe in Christ will judge the world. Verse 3 says, And since you're going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that you will judge angels? So you're going to judge the world and angels. Believers are going to judge the world and angels. See, it's not about, it's not about our life now. It's about our life to come. Our life now is preparation for the life to come. 
the life when we're ruling and reigning with him as kings and priests. He calls us kings and priests because we're born into the same line. We're part of the branch. We've been grafted in. So everything that belonged to him belonged to us. Everything that he does, we can do. We're grafted in. We're kings and priests. And as soon as we realize that, things are going to start to happen. But it's not going to happen until we realize it. It's not going to happen until we accept the position. Once we accept the position of kings and priests, it's going to happen. What is it? Everything we've been believing for. See, Jesus was the promise that came as a baby in a manger, grew up, lived a life, died the death of us, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is waiting to come back to the earth to rule and reign. It didn't stop at him going into heaven. And it doesn't stop at you getting saved. It doesn't stop at you getting filled with the Spirit. It's not going to stop. That's the point. This is like the, the train station gearing up to ready to go. Ruling and reigning. Ruling and reigning as kings and priests. The branch that we've been grafted into, the son of David, the seed of David. I'm going to read out of Revelations 20, and this is John telling us what he saw. Revelations 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and he shut him up, and he set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had they received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Who lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years? The ones he saw. The ones that had not worshipped the beast. The ones that hadn't received his mark on their forehead or in their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, and on the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. See, there's a ruling and a reigning coming with Jesus on the earth. Wow. Things aren't going to look like they look now, are they? Things aren't going to be happening that are happening now. They will rule and reign with him a thousand years. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Do you not know that the saints will judge angels? What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Do we believe that he is the lion of the tribe of Ju Judah? Do we believe that he is the seed of David who has the promised throne that he is to rule and reign forever and ever? Do we believe he's the king of kings and lord of lords and he's given us authority? Do we believe it? Believing it, we exercise our right to be here. We exercise our right to gather. 
We exercise our right to preach. We exercise our right to live and declare the goodness of God. Yes. Come on. We exercise our right to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. We exercise our right to cast out devils. Believers, this is believers, do we believe it? Believers will cast out devils. Believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Believers will speak in new tongues. Believers. What do we believe? We believe that he is Jesus, the son of David. Jesus, the son of God, the ever-living king, the one who is returning again, the one who we will rule and reign with, the one who has turned our lives around, the one who has made us new, given us his life, not our old life, to see that the life we had doesn't exist anymore, that we've been changed from the inside out. And that all the things we see on the earth are temporal, soon to pass, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Pastor mentioned how fast time goes, and he said it doesn't really matter because there is no time with God. That's why time is going fast. The, faster and clo the closer you get to God, the faster time will go because there's no time with God. So the closer you get to living in his realm, there is no time. And it's only his mercy that he's speeding up time. He said he would do it. He said he would speed up time because people aren't going to be able to handle what's coming on the earth. So it's his mercy that he's speeding it up because people aren't going to be able to handle what's coming on the earth. But as believers... We can handle what's coming on the earth. We can face any difficulty and face any challenge because we're believers. We've been endued with power from on high. And we don't judge by what we see and we don't judge by what we hear. We judge by what he says on the inside. Isn't that what's said about David and Jesus? The characteristic of Jesus is he wouldn't judge by what he sees with his eye and he wouldn't judge by what he hears. So no matter what it looks like, Jesus was able to cling to the promise. I am the Son of God. I will take my rightful place on the throne of David. These are all... Think about Jesus as a man on the earth, knowing he knows who he is. But he's still a man on the earth facing the opposition. He's going to die. There goes the throne. There goes the life you know. I mean, this is what the man thinks. He has to cling on the inside to what he knows. I'm the seed of David. I'm the son of God. I will rise again on the third day. He knows all the things that the prophets have said about him. And yet he's still faced with what's in his eyes and what's in his ears, what he's hearing. Just like we face it every day. Well, if you are the Son of God, well, if you really are, But you can't judge by what you see and you can't judge by what you hear. You have to judge by what you know and who you know. Yes. You judge by what he's spoken to your heart, not what it looks like on the outside. Some of you are believing for your family members and it's been so hard because you're judging by what you see and judging by what you hear. But you have to judge by what you know. Yes. Rahab, the Gentile, was told her whole family would be saved if she clung to the scarlet thread. Your whole family will be saved if you cling to the scarlet thread. Jesus is the answer. It doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. You either believe it or you don't. Come on. And if you believe it, you'll have corresponding action, clinging to the scarlet thread. 
The promise is to you and your children. The buck doesn't stop here. There's a race yet to be run. It's not time to pull back. It's not time to get weary. It's not time to throw your hands up. It's time to press in. It's time to press in and claim the things he's told you. Oh, I don't know if he's ever told me anything. When you've read the word or you've heard pastor preach and something pricks your heart and you say, that's for me, he's told you that. When you've read something in the word on your own and it pricks your heart, he's told you that. That's the rhema of the word. The logos of the word is the written word that you read all the time. But when you're reading it and it pricks your heart, that's the rhema of the word. That's the word God spoke to your heart. That's the word you grab and hold on to and never let go. That's the scarlet thread. It's your connection to him, hanging on to the promise. I heard somebody say while we were traveling last week, so it's in Minnesota, it's nobody here. Everybody's relieved, okay? <laughs> and yet, it bears repeating because I, I heard the heart of it. Jesus is coming back. And if we have, the, if we see that as a loss because you're giving this life up, you'll be sad. That's looking at it as a man. It's looking at it from your eyes and your ears. But if you look at it the way God sees it, it'll give you great joy. Because you'll see, he'll begin to show you more and more of how it's gonna be and what it's gonna be like. But it was a young woman that said, it makes me sad because I have so much life to live. But if Jesus comes back, it'll be over. No, it won't. It won't be over. It's just beginning. The best is saved for last. You're not going to lose anything. You're going to gain. Paul said it. Paul said whether I could go now, I could leave now, the earth, he's saying, but it would be far, it would be far better for me if I left. That's what Paul said. It'll be far better. If I leave now, whew, it'd be far better. But I'm staying for your sake, base is what he said. God wants, I've got a work to do, and God wants. But it would be far better. And that's the perspective is we need to start realizing it'll be far better. So it, when I heard that out of this young woman, I realized there's a whole generation of kids that may be feeling like they're going to miss out. They're not going to miss out. <laughs> they're going to usher in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They're going to see him. I happen to believe I'm going to see him coming to the earth. I happen to believe that. I, I, I believe it. But just think of it. The generation that will usher in the King of Kings and Lord, the generation that'll see him come through the clouds the way they saw him leave. And then rule and reign with him a thousand years. Wow. You see, we can't grasp it with our souls. We can't grasp it with our heads. There's not an understanding that will come for that. That's where we have to listen to our heart and believe it in our heart. That his life and his love that's been shed abroad in our heart is for all men. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? 
I think we need to hear that today. We, the saints, are to judge the world. And to me, that speaks of not bowing our knee to fear, not bowing our knee to the things that are coming at us, but to allow the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to speak in our hearts of how he wants to do things through us. He will lead us. He will guide us through every step of everything we face. Justin, can you go to the keys, please? James, one of the apostles in the book of Acts, in chapter 15, he stands up after Peter has preached to them about Jesus, the seed of David. And James said, Peter has just told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take for them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it is written, Afterward I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that, there's a reason, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord. including the Gentiles. All those that I have called by my name. The Lord has spoken. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He desires that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And as grafted in members of the body of Christ, we have everything we need to see that that happens. Everything. We come behind in no good gift. We're anointed of the Holy One. We have His Spirit and His love living on the inside of us. All we have to do is be willing vessels and allow Him to use us in any way He sees fit.